This letter is meant to call the attention of federal authorities in Australia, Canada, Germany, the United Kingdom, and the United States to multiple points of evidence about the origin and historical precedent of lockdowns. In a matter of days, Dr. Li Wenliang went from treating patients to becoming one. The 34-year-old ophthalmologist diagnosed Saturday with the Wuhan coronavirus, dying less than a week later in the same hospital in which he worked. But if action had been taken when he and others started sounding alarms, the severity of the outbreak might have been understood sooner. Struggling to communicate, Lee spoke with CNN briefly by phone on January 31st. You could hear the hospital machines pulsing in the background. In the words of Simon Lays, paraphrasing the great sinologist Laszlo Ladany, even the most mendacious propaganda must necessarily entertain some relation to truth. In Wuhan in late December, Dr. Li Wenliang warned his friends that a new SARS-like illness had begun spreading rapidly. Li's message inadvertently went viral on Chinese social media, causing widespread panic and anger at the Chinese Communist Party. Beginning the same day, the CCP lockdown Hubei province, leaked videos from Wuhan began flooding international social media sites, including Facebook, Twitter and YouTube, all of which are blocked in China, purporting to show the horrors of Wuhan's epidemic and the seriousness of its lockdown in scenes like into Zombieland and The Walking Dead. Official Chinese accounts widely shared an image of a hospital wing supposedly constructed in one day, but which actually showed an apartment 600 miles away. Then, beginning in March 2020, the entire world was bombarded with propaganda extolling the virtue of China's heavy-handed approach. December. Strange pneumonia cases reported. Roger that. January. We discovered a new virus. So what? It's dangerous. It's only a flu. Wear a mask. Don't wear a mask. Stay at home. It's violating human rights. Building temporary hospitals. It's a concentration camp. Built in 10 days. Show off. Time to lockdown. How barbaric. February. It's overwhelming our medical system. Look how backward China is. The virus is killing doctors. Typical third world. It's airborne. It'll magically go away in April. Everyone stay at home. Violation of human rights. Chinese state media bought numerous Facebook ads advertising China's pandemic response. All of which ran without Facebook's required political disclaimer. And began erroneously describing herd immunity, the inevitable endpoint of every epidemic, either by naturally acquired immunity or vaccination, as a strategy violating human rights. Sweden, whose leaders were unique in foregoing lockdowns, became a primary target of the CCP's propaganda campaign. In the words of China's state-run Global Times, so-called human rights, democracy, freedom, are heading in the wrong direction in Sweden and countries that are extremely irresponsible do not deserve to be China's friend. That was, of course, before the WHO adopted the bold, contradictory strategy of attempting to rewrite the historical definition of herd immunity wholesale. As recently as June 2020, the WHO's definition of herd immunity had properly included immunity developed through previous infection. But on October 15, 2020, the WHO effectively erased the eons-long history of naturally acquired immunity from its website. Herd immunity, also known as population immunity, is a concept used for vaccination, in which a population can be protected from a certain virus if a threshold of vaccination is reached. Herd immunity is achieved by protecting people from a virus, not by exposing them to it. 
China's official spokesperson, Hua Chunying, posted a video of a seven-year-old girl reciting the importance of strict social distancing among children. I can't go to parties. I can't go to Disneyland. But I know mm -hmm. all these sacrifices will be worth it. I, I stayed at home for two months already. I wear a mask. I wash my hands. I don't go to crowded areas in order to stop the virus spreading. Because if I know, if I don't do so, I might be affected and infect my dad, mom, and my brother. If they are sick, they might die, and I won't see them anymore. I will be even more upset. Coronavirus, coronavirus is a global health emergency. Everyone on this earth has a responsibility to stop it. It should not be a political matter to be used against other nations. Mm -hmm. I'm only seven years old. I understand it, but why do some adults don't get it? To those national leaders, stop blaming each other. Forget about your own interests. The virus won't go away by winning a political argument. We should use our strength power, determination, and courage, all together to fight with this common enemy, coronavirus. I have this common sense, why don't you? Simultaneously, hundreds of thousands of clandestine social media posts which were later flagged as state-sponsored, expressed admiration for China's lockdowns and longed for governments around the world to emulate them, while denigrating governments and world leaders who failed to follow suit. Governments including, but not limited to, Nigeria, Ghana, South Africa, Namibia, Kenya, France, Spain, Colombia, Brazil, Argentina, Canada, Australia, India, Germany, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Not only is this very poor global citizenship, but especially in light of the dubious science discussed above, it's worth wondering whether these social media posts were intended to popularize lockdowns as the end in themselves. When Italy became the first country outside China to lock down, Chinese experts arrived on March 12th and two days later advised a tighter lockdown. There are still too many people and behaviors on the street to improve. On March 19th, they repeated that Italy's lockdown was not strict enough. Here in Milan, the hardest hit area by COVID, there isn't a very strict lockdown. We need every citizen to be involved in the fight and follow this policy. Regions near Milan where businesses are closed, still under lockdown. Coronavirus epidemic rages in China. Life in much of the country has slowed to a crawl. Chinese company DJI donated drones to 22 US states to help enforce lockdown rules. DJI has developed a new hardware and software solution that allows government agencies to confidently use drone technology while keeping in accordance with stringent IT and data security requirements. We call it DJI Government Edition. Months later, DJI was blacklisted by the US for having enabled wide-scale human rights abuses within China through abusive genetic collection and analysis or high technology surveillance and facilitated the export of items by China that aid repressive regimes. On July 7th, FBI Director Christopher Wray disclosed that the CCP even specifically approached local politicians to endorse its pandemic response. And I will note that the pandemic has unfortunately not stopped any of this. In fact, we've heard from federal, state, and even local officials that Chinese diplomats are aggressively urging support for China's handling of the COVID-19 crisis. Yes, I mean, this is happening at both the federal and state levels. Not that long ago, we had a state senator who was recently even asked to introduce a resolution supporting China's response to the pandemic. The punchline is this. All of these seemingly inconsequential pressures add up to a policymaking environment 
in which Americans find themselves held over a barrel by the Chinese Communist Party. China has financial stakes in virtually every top media outlet. With regard to complex issues like lockdowns, China's influence can collectively tip these media entities in a dangerous direction, such as encouraging countries to copy China's response to COVID. Look, this is all happening so fast. And that's partly why I think so many people are afraid and anxious right now. And news coverage needs to understand and relate to those anxieties. Think about it, two weeks ago, few of us had ever heard of social distancing before. One week ago, flattened the curve, had barely even entered the lexicon. Yeah, you know, we talked about this now famous graph on this show a week ago, and I didn't even use the term flatten the curve. Uh, the, the, these things are changing so quickly. And these measures are upending life in the United States and in many parts of the globe. Look, some of you would be normally at a house of worship at this hour. You're at home watching television instead because so many religious institutions have closed. But we can still turn to the Holy Book for inspiration. Matthew 7, 12 is on my mind today. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Or Levit Leviticus 19, 18. I love your neighbor as thyself. Protect each other. That's the drive behind all of these closures, a temporary end to sports, live cultural performances, arts, style. But the question is, are, are people really getting it? Is social distancing enough? Is it happening in great enough numbers all across the country to make the impact it needs to have? It's an open question, I think, right now. In this moment, phones and televisions are our lifelines. They are our connections to the outside world. And that means the journalists are playing a critical role. That's why we are here in this building right now. Healthcare workers are the heroes on the front lines. They are protecting the public. And then media workers are empowering the public with information from those experts. The CCP has shaped the media's scientific narratives by consistently promoting the falsehood that China controlled the virus, which is, of course, a bald-faced lie. A confidential report from the U.S. Intelligence Committee indicates that Chinese officials may have altered the total number of coronavirus cases found within its borders. The report concluded that China's government has underreported both the total number of confirmed COVID-19 cases as well as the number of deaths in the country from the virus. Nonetheless, by encouraging mainstream publications to repeat the lie that China controlled the virus, the CCP has normalized this lie and ensured its forged data remains integral to scientific discourse. If you compare what we're doing here in the United States to what China has done to control its epidemic, we are deficient. Even in the most extreme case, which is New York or California, we're not doing even a fraction of what China did to control its epidemic. But there's an enormous amount to learn from. China has put into place an extraordinarily proactive, focused public health approach. And with that, they are able to get back out again. And that's what every community in the world needs to do. China's decision to lock down Wuhan showed that the government acted tremendously decisively in the face of an acute emergency. Um, and by taking those actions, China led the world in the response to this pandemic. It was not only the right thing to do, but it also showed other countries how they should respond in the face of such an acute threat. So I think we have a great deal to thank China for uh, about the way that it handled the outbreak in Wuhan. The significance of China's global lockdown propaganda campaign is the intent behind it. While the scientific issues described above, criminal negligence by the WHO, alarmist mortality models, dubious PCR tests, and bad studies on asymptomatic transmission could theoretically be attributed to incompetence, the CCP's propaganda is evidence of deliberation. Sloppy science may be professionally shameful, but it is neither a crime nor a moral failing. The possibility of corruption and fraud, on the other hand, is another matter.
want to see if you can comment a bit on how Taiwan has done so far in terms of containing the virus. Well, we've, we've already talked about China. And, um, you know, when you look across all the different areas of, uh, of China, they've actually all done quite a good job. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for inviting us to participate. And, uh, and good luck as you go forward with the battle in Hong Kong.